an engineer. Well, you can see, uh, you recognize me, usually my, uh, my pants don't reach the floor. And uh, people recognize you at parties. Hey, you're an engineer, aren't you? Hey man, can you fix the blender? Yeah, you just uh, hold the plug in the wall real firmly and uh, put the blender under some cold running water. <laughs> See, that's, it's only funny if you're scientifically literate. <laughs> so I'm trying to turn this thing on, man. Can we energize plugging in the thing? No? Well, our first slide you may be familiar with. <laughs> put in my password. <laughs> You see how this indicates that it doesn't need to be put in? Is it science rules? It's not really science rules. Should I unplug and replug? She's gonna try to advance. Whoa, password. <laughs> Population. My parents and I were disappointed that we missed it changing from 2,999,999,999 to 3,000,000,000. Billion. Billion. This afternoon in my hotel room, the world's population is now 7 billion. Wow. More than double in my lifetime. That change is changing everything, and that's why you guys are going to have to work together to, dare I say it, Change the world! Perhaps you're familiar with this graph that depicts the world's temperature over the last thousand years. We whimsically call it the hockey stick because there's the shaft of the stick and there is the blade of the stick. So everybody, it's not that the world is getting warmer. It's not that there's more carbon dioxide than there has been in a long time. The problem is the rate the speed at which the world is getting warmer, that's why you've got to change things. Uh, full disclosure, if you read The Hockey Stick by Michael Mann, I hope you notice that I wrote the foreword. Uh, not that that's big a deal. Now, uh, these same guys have gone back not a thousand years, but now 10,000 years, so the little brown line are there any professors here? Anybody? So I just want you to know, when you take the laser pointer and do this with it, it, does, it doesn't really help anybody. Uh, but so that's the hockey stick right there. Now, uh, taking these same, or same techniques, taking back 10,000 years, it's now the sickle, the hockey sickle of climate change. So it's the speed, it's the rate that we're all going to have to work to change the world. Now, coming up uh, next week will be our beloved film Noah, starring uh, the lady's favorite, Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe. So you'll see up there if you can read the fine print. It's, it's based on a worldwide myth that, that gives people insight, the cornerstone of faith. The Noah, the uh, Noahian, uh, Noahan myth is the cornerstone of somebody's faith. Now you may have heard about this recently. I was in uh, Petersburg, Kentucky. Uh, yes, I love you. So people like Elise Andrews quite understandably criticized 
me for doing this because it elevates this guy, but I claim it draws attention to an extraordinary view yeah. that is not in the best interest of the world. So, uh, I, I mean, the debate went pretty well for me. Yeah. So here are, some, here are just a couple of the greatest hits uh, from the debate. His arc is going to be 500 feet long. Uh, the longest ship anybody was able to build out of wood was um, 300 feet and it twisted apart and sank. Uh, which is hilarious unless you're one of the 14 crewmen that went down with it. And then, uh, but it does show you how unreasonable and crazy it is. Uh, then the other one, this is his map. This is the Answers in Genesis map, but I asked him a question, you may remember. Uh, if all, if this, uh, Noah's Ark ran aground on Mount, Mount Ararat in Mesopotamia, uh, then why wouldn't we find some kangaroos in Vietnam or Laos or someplace? But as far as I know, there aren't any. Are you you're one of them? Yeah. And so uh, then I asked him, you may recall, about these fossil skulls found in many places around the world. Uh, this one is uh, nothing but fun, the Dominici 52. Then, uh, do you know where the humans are, anybody? Here's the, uh, the pointer. Yeah, the humans are right there. Oh, I'm sorry. Right there. And this one with the really small brain case here, that's, that's my old boss. <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> Might have been. Then um, I was gratified in so many ways uh, when uh, this picture was sent around the internet. Thank you. Thank you. In other words, I got this guy, or this, it looks it's a family vehicle, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a good, good, happy values, but uh, Bill Nye, the science lie, yes, because if we can just, we can just get rid of Bill Nye, the Earth will suddenly be 6,000 years old. Just, we can just get rid of me. But it was quite gratifying that someone went to that much trouble. It's a cloudy day in Jackson County, Tennessee, and uh, I guess whatever paint they used is waterproof. That's the thing, I'm gratified that someone went to that much trouble. Uh, and I just want to remind everybody that I did mention that there are six, six billion people in the world who are deeply religious and get a lot out of the religious community, but they're not crazy! And there's a guy born in the U.S. There's a guy who spent a lot of time in the oil patch here in Texas, in the oil field in Texas. In the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. We want the United States to be the world leader in this sort of thing. Now, as you may know, I have taken a day job. Anybody else have a day job? Wow, it's like that a third of you. That's crazy. <laughs> Into your time. Yeah. I, I, I don't cut. If you those who manage without me, don't go back. No. <laughs> but I'm the CEO. I'm the head guy of the planetary society. Woo! I just <laughs> that we and I just remind you that some advance for the space and creation and science and the betterment of humankind never <laughs> your crown. If you've never visited Media Man Gator, Arizona, it was I finally reckon go, you get, go there. Plan about 25,000 years ago. Minus 20 years of the sign experiment. Minus 25,000. Uh, common era. It's over there in the middle. Big hole. Uh, the people, if you ever go under, will notice this on river on the ground. Water river thought was an underwater, underground, or an underland river. It's not ever on the river. It was a meat that caused that sink. But that was hurt, my friends. It was a meteor from out of face. So when I'm in, uh, economy. And so and through, I was in Mark, uh, spherical class. You may know, make remarkable course from error as you know, I had Sagan for me. He's like, he do. I'm sure. I'm going to hurt your neck. What is he doing here? Hey, uh, he's crowd. I'm going to talk. All right, about the talk. A girl Sagan, you should quite a bit of you. Augustament. Uh, if from Sar and Meteor, the, uh, a rock, the North Face. 
You're gonna hit the champ Earth Russia. Of course. Is a very this land that you'll hit right it was over before and so they're a ton in Siberia graph over a year that you made anybody went up last took this photo a month. But in remember next year and we have your uh you bit through the sky and everybody immediately ran streaking windows by and streaking to body and then almost up to the wind and it's lit to see the sonic boom in the sky the earth was three brought all there they saw the window and was hit by the door of the well it kind of smashed a thousand people and people that same hospital Sorry, the, the people for society ignited a grant to an amateur astronomer at Provine who found the 12 d amateur team for Spain, which came between 20 the Earth, day four, and a synchronous sequence. My friends, if one of these hit the Earth, it would, if it were to hit, <laughs> cannot help but remember my second grade teacher, I McGonagall. But remember, the second, yes, Mrs. Hess. Yes. Reading from a book, a book, yeah, man had given her the book. The man that the <laughs> made her read the book, and the book said, Ancient time book, of course, died out because the small brains. So they had and all the mammals, and all the dying, the food, and the mammals died out. <laughs> and even Dying Gonagal knew that that was just stupid. Come on, I mean, this, come on, I'm a Tyrannosaurus. You are a rabbit. You <laughs> are it's just unpossible. So in my lifetime, man, people rediscovered the meat mother, the crater of, of Chicas of Mexico. Here, looked off for oil. They found a big ring of uh, magnetically influenced rock out of it. It's almost certainly would kill the ancient dinosaurs. And that, what I'm certain to you is, it could happen again, and it is preventable. We are living at a time it, when we, our generations, could we prevent the only preventable natural disaster? We could to deflect an asteroid. So how would you do it? Recommend against Bruce Willis. Not just because he's a professional actor rather than an astronaut, but if you blow the thing up, it may backfire, pun intended, where you get actually some pieces coming at you even faster, even more deadly. So uh, what you might do is go out there with your rocket, land on the surface of the asteroid, and turn on the rocket motor. <laughs> There's no sound, it's just... <laughs> but I gotta tell you, that probably won't work. You can't get enough fuel out there to do it. It takes just a huge amount of energy to deflect an asteroid. But don't worry! The Planetary Society is here for you! We got this, this idea for the laser bees! Solar-powered spacecraft that energize lasers and they laze the surface of the asteroid, causing pieces of it to volatize, eject into space, and the momentum of the ejecta is enough to nudge the asteroid so it just misses the Earth. Uh, we go to uh, Strathclyde University in Scotland and zap the surface of rocks and it turns out to be a little more effective than people thought. We all thought that the beam of the laser would get tangled up in the ejected material, but it's pretty good. It goes right through it. No, so if you want to save the world, stick with us. I don't care about me, it's you. Uh, so, now, the, here I am on the roof of my house. No, actually, I'm, I'm here. I'm right here. That's a picture of me on the roof of my house. And I mention it because in the background of my four kilowatts of solar, in the foreground is my solar tube dome, which has uh, grooves in it like a Fresnel lens, like in these lights. It's much more effective than a skylight. When the sun's low in the sky, the light's directed down the tube. I still go into that room trying to turn the lights off. And in the foreground is my solar hot water system. People! Woo! This is the United States! Who's better at plumbing than the United States? I mean, maybe Holland, I don't know. So I want somebody out here to go into the solar hot water business. So that we save all this energy and so that you 
get rich. <laughs> People were in Texas. The wind blows all the freaking time, all right? Yeah. So I want somebody out here to get the wind, the solar panels, put the electricity into my Nissan Leaf, which I drive to LAX. Woo! And then we know where all the cars are parked during the day. We know where they're at the football game. We know they're in the shopping mall. We know they're in the, when they're at South By. And then we move the electricity around North America carefully, the same way we know how many toilets flush at halftime and everything else. The key, what I want you all to do is invent the better battery, okay? If we had batteries that were, uh, let's say, liquid metal, where they get hot when you put electricity into them, the metal turns liquid. This is uh, magnesium on the surface, a layer of molten table salt, and then antimony or antimony next to tin on the periodic table on the bottom. And we put it under every building all over Austin. We collect all this energy all day, and we put it in liquid metal batteries, and we, dare I say it, change the world! Yeah. Then we use a smart grid that you guys are gonna design. And then we send it on nanotube transmission lines all over North America. And we change the world. Woo! Now, uh, as you may know, Carl Sagan's papers were sent to the Library of Congress this year by uh, Andrea and Seth McFarlane, who are producing Cosmos with our good buddy Neil deGrasse Tyson. that exhibit was a picture taken by the Cassini spacecraft. This is the underside of Saturn, the south side of Saturn, with uh, the Saturnian rings up there in the upper right. And if you look closely, you will see the Earth right there. That's it. That's everybody. Okay, if you were to go up this way, 100,000 kilometers or so, there's the Earth right there. See it? There. Where? Where? It's right, it's right there. There it is. So I hearken to third grade, Mrs. Cochran. She said, there are more stars in the sky than grains of sand on the beach. And I would not have expressed it this way, but at South By we could easily say, I mean, Mrs. Cochran, there's a lot of grains of sand. Are you, are you high? I mean, have you ever been to a beach, Mrs. Cochran? You look that way, a thousand nautical miles that way, a thousand, there's just sand. Sand, you shuffle your feet and there's more sand. You look behind you, there's sand. The tide goes out that far, there's more sand. How could it possibly be? But yet, my friends, there is apparently, there are more stars than the grains of sand on a beach. So I was a kid at this time, uh, even in third grade. <laughs> and I remember thinking, if you looked at me from a place like this, out in deep space, you could not distinguish me from a grain of sand. I mean, I'm just another grain. I'm just another speck of sand, all with all these other specks of sand. And when you look at the Earth in a view like this, it's nothing. It's just another speck. I am a speck standing on a bunch of specks with the sun, which is a completely unremarkable star. It's just another speck. Hey, hey, hey! Where's the fire, people? <laughs> Talk in here. Thank you. It's, it's very amazing, very glad that we have an organized society where we have an emergency vehicle.